Okay, hello everyone at home, hello everyone in class. Uh, I've, I've learned a new trick today, I hope it worked. I turned on the live stream and I quickly sat down so it looked better. Yeah. Okay. So we don't see the top of your head? Yeah. I'm either showing my backside, belly, or the top of my head. And uh, so, I'm trying to be a little more uh, camera sensitive here. Hello to everyone. We got several folks here in class, and uh, hopefully a lot of you out there in the big wide world uh, watching us as well. Uh, some of you uh, in the class may not know that we have a group uh, in McKinney uh, that watches us every week uh, on the YouTube. Uh, so they 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 don't catch it on Sunday morning. Uh, they do watch the live stream of worship uh, and. So hello to our McKinney friends, uh, especially uh, today, and to everyone else who's joining us wherever you may be. So a um, little program announcement. Uh, if you're on our class email list, and I hope everyone is, um, you should have gotten a note from Charlene yesterday. Um, hey, John. Howdy. Come hey. join us. You haven't seen Jim, have you? Jim Hancock? Uh-huh. No. He's teaching somewhere, is he in your class? Yes. <laughs> oh, but he hasn't shown up? Well, not yet. Uh-oh. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry. To okay, you. no worries. Good to see you. Yeah. Uh, so, next week, I'm going to start uh, maybe... That six... didn't go out yesterday. It's oh, it was... On the, it's on, just went on the Facebook page. Okay. So, it'll go out today. <laughs> It'll go out today. Uh, next week, I'm going to start a eh, maybe eight-week study of uh, the book of Ruth. Okay, so I, I don't know that if I've ever taught Ruth, it's been years and years and years ago. Ruth is a short book. It's only four chapters uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, but we're going to stretch it as much as we can. Uh, it's very relevant, and I'm going to be using as a source book a book that uh, actually I've cheated here. Well, it's not cheating. It's, you know, sharing. Um, Mike Caps, who's Jessica's husband, is currently teaching this book in Compass class uh, upstairs. And I was talking to one of their class members who was just raving about it. And I went and looked up the book and thought, this is fantastic. So it's written by two Irishmen. Uh, one a poet, the other a, I don't know if he's clergy, uh, or the other not a poet, a, a writer, a speaker, who coincidentally died after the manuscript was written before it was published. But they're writing uh, out of their experience in Ireland with, laid against the troubles, as they say over there, and laid against uh, Brexit. They were writing at the time of all the debate over Brexit. And they engaged a process where they went and <clears throat> um, held meetings across Ireland and Scotland and several other places. And they brought 5,000 people together in different small groups to talk about what divides them and how they might find some common ground. And out of that, of all things, they found resonance in the book of Ruth, which is a book, uh, it's, a, it's a biblical story about crossing boundaries, about being away from home, about being a stranger in a new land, about trying to find your balance, about all of these things. Uh, and so I thought this would be perfect for us because, <clears throat> number one, it's beautifully written, the book. Number two, uh, it's nice to have a brief study out of an Old Testament book like this that we've not done, done before. Uh, number three, it's a book that's focused on how we can find something to agree on. Uh, and number four, uh, it is uh, exceedingly relevant to our time. And I don't know what number, number five, I love the fact that it's written by people outside the United States and we can gain a different perspective. Uh, if you've ever been to Ireland, uh, is anyone in here who traveled with us on the Ireland trip? Yeah, Joni? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the most amazing things was um, 
we were on our little bus and you just cross a river or a bridge or, you know, a little fence and you're from Republic of Ireland into Northern Ireland. And this is, this is what used to be and was going to be again if, you know, if, if Brexit had gone its most extreme route, checkpoints again, uh, which is, um, it, it'd be like going from uh, Dallas to Waxahachie and you're in a different uh, country, a different oh. political, I mean, it's just, like if you if you crossed over I twenty, <laughs> you know you'd have to stop at a checkpoint or something. That, that's what it's like. And so they're writing out of that background, which I think will. So you do not have to buy the book. You do not have to follow along. I'm sure I will rehash most of what they say that's relevant. If you would like to get the book, if you would like to read along, uh, it's available on Amazon. It's available for Kindle. It's available whatever. Uh, it's, the Kindle version I bought, I think it was 15 bucks. Uh, and I, th I think the soft cover version I saw was 17 or something like that. It is 16.39, but with tax, it's 17.74. And if people want me to order a group of them, they can pay me 20 because I don't deal with change. <laughs> <laughs> if you want Charlene to get you the book, let her know. If you want to get it on your own, if you don't want to get it, that's fine. You do not have to read it along with us. What is the name of it? What is the name of it, Charlene? It is called Borders and Belonging, the Book of Ruth, a Story of Our Times. Borders and Belongings, the Book of Ruth, a Story of Our Time. Okay? Uh, and so all, all credit for this goes to Mike Caps. <laughs> <laughs> Again, who's teaching this in compass class right now? I think he's doing it in four weeks. Of course, I can't do four weeks. I'm gonna have to do eight. The book has eight chapters. You think? Uh, we'll, we're gonna do our best. We'll see. You may get bored with it, and we'll move on. But uh, uh, it, anyhow, uh, thanks to Mike for finding. I think he actually met the poet author. It's only been out since the end of January. Yeah, he, he met the author at a conference. Oh, maybe a year. Maybe yeah. It's been out. So anyhow, it's very it's contemporary, and it's a different take on Ruth. All right, so that's where that's where we're headed for the next few weeks. I'm excited about that. Uh, so y'all had asked last week if we could spend a, a week just sort of talking about a, a refresher on how we got the Bible and how it's come to be, because so often uh, we make references to this, and um, I, I just want to give a sort of high level overview that for anyone who grew up in a Southern Baptist Sunday school is going to be a review session. You can imagine, you know, playing with the little blocks uh, of the books of the Bible that you organize. We still have those up in classrooms here. Or uh, having sword drills. Or sword drills. Oh, yeah. I found my sword recently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you may bring it in. Too. Okay, right? So, it, the, but as we go over time, we tend to forget some of these things, right? Uh, and I want to begin by saying how we got the name Bible. Why do we call it a Bible? The Latin word is Biblia. Biblia. B-I-B-L-I-A. Uh, that would, you, you couldn't sing that, the, the B-I-B-L-I-A, the B-I-B-L-I-A. It doesn't quite fit. Okay. Uh, the Biblia is a Latin word that means little books. Little books. And so one of the big mistakes that we all fall into is thinking of the Bible as a book. We call it the good book. Okay. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but as we do so, we've got to remember that what the Bible actually is is a collection of little books. Uh, this, this is like, um, sorry to make this so secular, but this is like a Reader's Digest collection. You know, I, I remember as a kid, my parents subscribed to the Reader's Digest book club. And, you know, we would get these big hardbound volumes. I don't know if it was every month or quarter, whatever it was. And they had like three books in them, right? Uh, and so this, the Bible is a collection of little books. And they're, they've all been organized in a way that we see as one book today. But we've got to remember they were never written as a book, right? So as someone who is an author, 
uh, and I've got a manuscript, as you know, at the publisher right now, I sat down and wrote an entire book from A to Z, not in one sitting, but over time, but with the trajectory in mind that I, I had an outline and I'm going from here to here. Same thing you've done with many of your own writing projects, right? That is not how the Bible came to be. Uh, and so it's important to remember that we have a library of books here uh, as well. All right, uh, how many books in the Bible? 66, 66 Philip 66, right? Uh, 39 in the Old Testament, which we often now, you'll often hear me refer to the term Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and why is that? Well, because th these were Judaism scriptures before they were ours. <laughs> We call them the Old Testament in, com in contrast to our New Testament, right? But to the people who originally received these texts, there's nothing old and new about them. It is their scripture, right? And so it's, I find it more respectful to talk about the Hebrew scriptures, but we say Old Testament and New Testament. So 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. But if you have a Bible and you hold it up and you were to put your finger between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, you would notice that like two-thirds of the Bible is the Hebrew Scriptures and one-third is the New Testament, right? So there's much shorter writings and there's much longer writings in the uh, Hebrew Scriptures as well. I know if you open it straight up in the middle of your Psalms. Uh, yeah, it, it, so it used to be, uh, now with all these Bible helps in Bibles, oh, yeah. at the back, if you have like a concordance or something, it's going to mess you up. And you might find yourself in Proverbs or Lamentations or something With a special sword drill Bible, you, you, you know where you're landing, right? Uh, so what's interesting here is in, in these Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, we see these, uh, Christianity organizes these in four headings. Law, history, poetry, prophecy. And again, this is uh, third grade Sunday school or whatever grade Sunday school. This is elementary Sunday school stuff. You've been teaching this, you know, you, you know and we, we drill this into kids uh, as well. <clears throat> in Judaism, they arrange the same books in a different order using three headings. So if you were to look at a, a Jewish book of scriptures, you would find the same material, but it would be organized in a different order than we know it as Christians. And what did they leave out? Uh, they haven't left anything out. It's just in a different order. I mean the Oh, the headings. Topic. So the headings, are they have are law, prophecy, and writings. So they don't, uh, we have a section called poetry. They would see that as part of the writings, right? And th there's a good reason for that. Uh, we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. Um, because the first five books of, oh, yes, Susan. Right. And that is the Torah? Is that, a, is that the same thing as the Hebrew, as we? Yeah, the Torah is the law. The law section of the Hebrew scriptures is called Torah, right? Uh, so we, we, we call, um, uh, oh, I lost my place. What is the word I'm thinking of here? Uh, well, they, the Jewish use more than just the Torah, right? Although they refer to the Torah a lot, they recognize and use the others. So if in Judaism, you have Torah and you have all the scriptures, right? Uh, Torah has a special place there, but you also have a lot of rabbinical uh, writings through the years. And they still consider those to be holy as well. Well, not at the same level, but uh, there, there is a significant uh, tradition there of paying attention to the rabbinic writings and interpretations. Uh, and you know, this is, this is something that we Protestants don't understand because we've been, we've been, and particularly Baptists, you know, we're really, really bad about this. And there's reasons. They're not bad reasons. Uh, we don't tend to pay attention to the tradition that has informed our faith because we're also independent and autonomous. It's Jesus and me, right? Jesus and me. Um, I had a fascinating webinar I did this week with David Gushy, who's an ethicist from Mercer University and one of my columnists, and he's got a new book out 
uh, called a Christian Ethics a Primer, uh, a Primer, uh, and, and it is just giving the basics of Christian ethics. And we were talking about how the the notion of Christian ethics is is found in Scripture, but it has been refined and commented upon over time and developed uh, by great biblical minds. Uh, and there, there is a tradition behind that. Judaism and Catholicism are much better about this than Protestantism. One of the, one of the pluses, for whatever else you want to say about Catholic Church, one of the pluses is a rich repository of some of the best Catholic minds uh, in the world commenting and creating a tradition that has influenced today. We tend to not, you know, we don't, we don't have that. We, we have a tradition, but it's more oral and it's more passed down and it's more segmented and maybe even more regional um, in, in a sense as well. Okay, I'm off topic. Let me get back on. Uh, there is a sense in which these first five, the, uh, the first five books of the Old Testament, right, um, have to maybe be considered uh, among the 11 chapters. The, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are different than the rest of Genesis. And there are some scholars who would say, all right, carve out the first 11 chapters of Genesis into its own thing. And this is, you know, the beginnings kind of stories. Uh, and then the rest of that forward uh, are sort of these epic stories of the, the, of the early forebears there, right? Um, and then we get in the Hebrew scriptures, the next 12 books that are books of history. This is uh, Joshua through Esther, right? And they, they, they de detail events that happen to the Jewish people. Uh, and then sometimes, most of the time, we call the next set of books poetry. And this is like Job through Song of Solomon, including Psalms. And these books are very different than each other, but they all use a literary style that is not prose. All right, and this is very important <clears throat> because these books, on their face, require a different kind of reading than other parts of the Bible. They are not intended to be taken literally, right? And here's where we get into a lot of trouble. And then the last 17 books, 17, from Isaiah through Malachi, are books of prophecy. And we've said this before, but let me just point out again, prophecy does not mean foretelling the future in this case. I prophesy that you're going to be wealthy today. That's not what this is. Uh, prophecy is recording God's messages to God's people. And this is woes and blessings and all of that, right? So that's the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures. And then, likewise, we can divide the New Testament, it's 27 books, into a, some neat order as well. And there is some organization to this. Those of you who like to file things neatly, <clears throat> you're going to like the Bible uh, for this, particularly the New Testament. Because we organize the first four books as the Gospels, right? And they all tell the story in different layers of the life of Jesus, uh, the life and ministry of Jesus. And again, at the risk of being way too basic, uh, I, and I don't want to insult you, but just to remind us all, they're all written from different viewpoints. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar in many ways, and thus we call them the synoptic Gospels. They line up more. Whereas the Gospel of John often gives us a different take and originated in a different source. So scholars are pretty well convinced, and you can read this and see for yourself. We've talked about this before. I've actually had a handout to you uh, where you can lay Matthew, Mark, and Luke against each other and find all these areas of overlap. Uh, and it appears that Mark was written first and became source material for Matthew and Luke. Uh, but then there are other sources that came in along the way as well. So you go from the Gospels to Luke, I mean to, to, to Acts, with a reminder that Acts is a sequel to the book of Luke. 
also written by Luke, right? But Acts is different than the Gospels because it picks up the story of the early church after the resurrection and, the, and at the beginning of the ascension, right? So Acts is really a different, it's, it's, it's in a category by itself. It's like a, a bridging book in the New Testament that then leads to the bulk of the New Testament, 21 letters. Or we, the, the, the fancy word for this is epistles, right? Uh, and these are from Paul and other church leaders to congregations. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. But then we round out the New Testament with this left behind book um, <laughs> that some of us think should have been left behind uh, <laughs> called Revelation, right? That is an example of apocalyptic writing. Um, and it is, again, different than anything else in the New Testament. It does not fit the literary style of, uh, of anything else that. So here, this is, I've just given you a tour of the library. Uh, th these are the sections uh, in the library. So we've got to remember, and I I'm repeating myself from many, many times here, the Bible has limitations. We cannot expect to the Bible things that it does not promise of itself, right? The Bible is not a complete history of the world. The, the Bible is not an answer book for everything that you want to throw at it, right? The Bible originates in a time, actually, in a series of times when it's written. And we've got to be mindful of the origin of the stories. So when we come up on things about how the earth operates and the sun stands still and all of these things and the stars and whatnot, we've got to remember these were written by people who did not have a scientific understanding the way we do today. Uh, and so we've got to, we've got to understand what they were saying in their time. Now, side note, some of you are going to say, but wait a minute, what about divine inspiration? Which is actually a whole other conversation. Uh, multiple theories of inspiration. If we have time, we'll talk about that at the end of the lesson today, but it, it, we may not get there. Uh, there is a, a view of inspiration that holds that God dictated every word of the Bible to those who wrote it verbatim, and that every word of the Bible is the direct word of God spoken. Uh, I do not hold that view. <laughs> Most of us don't hold that view. Uh, there's a lot of problems with that view, uh, because uh, for one, you got a lot of contradictions in the Bible, uh, which, it, anyhow, that's, that's my answer to that question, okay? So what is the big purpose of the Bible? The, the Bible's purpose is to describe the nature of God and the will of God. So we are, we, are, we are trying to understand who is God and what is God about in the world. One of the things we moderns want to find from the Bible that is the wrong question to ask is how. The Bible tells us why. The Bible seldom tells us how. Even on the most basic things, we don't know how. How are the dead raised to newness of life in Christ? We don't know. It's a mystery to us still. How did these miracles happen? We don't know. It doesn't tell us a formula or an incantation to do these things, right? How did Jesus walk on water? How did the Red Sea part? How, 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 how? And so many Christians have wasted their time trying to find the how out of the Bible that they've missed the why. Right? So the important thing is why. We can't make the Bible something that's not. But so often it's just thrown in there as being, well, you just got to trust. You got to have faith. Well, and the, and the reality is you do have to have faith, yeah. right? We, the, the Bible is a book that has to be read on faith. Yeah, uh, but pretty much anything you read, you have to have some level of faith in it, right? Uh, I mean, how do you know? So uh, let's say you're reading a cookbook. 
I'm not comparing the Bible to a cookbook. <laughs> For those of you on Heresy Watch. Uh, but if you're, it, it, like, this morning, I got up and made from scratch biscuits. Thank you very much. Um, and I followed a recipe, <laughs> amazingly. It's a recipe that I've used before, and I knew that it worked, right? But it's also in a good housekeeping cookbook <laughs> that seems to be trustworthy. But still, I am having some faith that this recipe is going to work when I'm reading the instructions and making it. Well, part of that's based on experience because it's worked before. Part of it's based upon the experience of other people as well. And we see the same thing in the Bible. It is trustworthy to us because it has stood this test of time. And people throughout the generations have found it to be reliable. Uh, and this is its testimony to us. Remember that the early church did not have the New Testament. The scriptures to them, when Jesus references the scriptures and when Paul references the scriptures, they are talking about the Hebrew scriptures. <clears throat> because uh, they were making the Gospels and the epistles even then when they did this. And, and it was, it was so the New Testament was written over a period, oh, by the way, Old Testament was written over a period of, what, 1,100 more, or more years, depending on how you see the world, right? New Testament was written just in a period of 100 years. Uh, at the, at, and there's disagreement over this, right? But within the span of a century, we get the New Testament written. Right, and, and I would argue maybe even less than that, uh, depending on how you feel about a couple of these, these books. We recently studied 1 Thessalonians, which is pretty commonly accepted as the earliest written letter that we have in the New Testament today. Uh, and how do you know this? Well, you read and you lay things against each other, right? You, you, you connect the dots in the stories as they go. All right, I'm off track again, but please stop me with questions. A question. Yeah. Genesis, you know, you're saying how normally we think of, like, I don't know, the Exodus, whatever, people are writing about this is happening, and yeah. you think of them as telling the story as it's happening, or just shortly right. after it's happening. But how do you explain the, the creation? Oh. Who was sitting there in the yeah. Garden of Eden writing? Thank you, Jim. That's a great question. Who, who yeah. was the scribe in the Garden of Eden? Yeah. Uh, and now you, you've identified one of the big problems with Genesis, right? And there are multiple problems with Genesis, <clears throat> but that's one of them, right? Um, and here's the reality. That, and someone give me a signal when we get close to time because I'm, I'm not using it. It's 10.28. Okay, well, I, man, I've got to talk fast. You want me to wave my hand. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. even the oldest parts of the Old Testament were not written down until the Babylonian exile. Okay, so up to this point, everything had been oral tradition. And it's only during the exile and after the exile that the, the, the Hebrew scholars, we would call them scholars, they would have used that word necessarily, uh, leaders uh, begin actually writing down these stories that have been passed on and passed on. So the reason, the reason these stories read the way they do, uh, the cadence they have, uh, the repetition they have, is they were meant to be told not to be read. And so the writers have uh, captured the oral tradition uh, so that we, it can be preserved that they never had the opportunity to do that before. So, no, no, uh, you know, this is what some people want to attribute the, the authorship of Genesis to Moses. Truth is, we don't know. I mean, Moses probably contributed to it, but what, what Genesis probably is, please do not be shocked, is a collection of writings by various writers who contributed to this, and it's a bit of an anthology that's been put together and someone edited it uh, in, a, in a sense, right? But they took these stories, and it might have even been a group project, uh, in a sense, to, to do this. There's an interesting parallel, though, <clears throat> between that and the epistles of the New Testament, 
because we've got to remember that the epistles, and we talked about this last week, were written to be read aloud. Because number one, it was much more difficult. You, there was no the only way to duplicate something in that time was by hand. But the vast majority of people could neither read nor write, even at that time. So uh, most people gathering in the early church and in the synagogues and all would not have the ability to read the, these letters, to, even if they were handed a copy, right? So most often someone would stand before the assembly and read it out loud. And this is why even in Paul's letters and the other letters of the New Testament, we get repetition. There are things that are said multiple times, and it's a way of drilling it in. Uh, this is an oral, oral uh, tradition that is embodied even in the New Testament. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I hope, hopefully this helps you understand sort of why things are the way they are. Again, Old Testament written in Hebrew, New Testament written in Greek, but both of them in ancient forms of that, not really the same as modern um, Greek or Hebrew. But there are there are no similarities that, that we know, right? Now the Dead Sea Scrolls, what Okay. What are the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah. So the Dead Sea Scrolls are some writings that were found uh, in the Dead Sea. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls are some writings that were found hidden, uh, buried in, in a cave in a place called Qumran, uh, out in the desert, in the um, and were written and preserved by uh, a sect of the Essenes uh, that was a, a separate sect of Judaism, right? And what the, they had preserved these and other writings uh, that the, once they were discovered, I can't remember what year that was, but once they were discovered, the best, the most important thing that happened was did anyone remember what year that was? It was around 48, right after World War II. Right after World War II. Yeah. During Indiana Jones' time. Uh, <laughs> uh, what they did was they helped fill in some blanks. Because as I mentioned last week, we do not have an original manuscript, an original copy of any book of the Bible. They've all been copied and copied and copied and copied and passed down, passed down, passed down. And in time, some, you know, little flaws happened because someone didn't include the right little word or, or accent mark or something. And the Dead Sea Scrolls help, they are the closest to an original source material on some parts of the Bible that we've ever seen. And they helped fill in some gaps. They didn't necessarily provide new revelations that, oh, you know, we've had this all wrong, uh, but they helped fill in some of those things, right? Uh, it's it's like um, uh, if you lived in a house for a long time and you discovered all of a sudden in the attic someone had left the blueprints for the house, but how it was built. But they were sort of torn and tattered and you couldn't see all of it. But it gave you enough that you could say, oh, I see. I see how this thing works, right? This is what the Dead Sea Scrolls did to help us with this. Is that helpful? What kind of time frame is does it refer back? I mean, because we, we're working off of what the Latin Vulgate or something? I don't know. Yeah. Whatever we're working off of the Bible, the oldest version, you know, that we're working off of, not just King James. This predates that. It worked off. These would have been first century. What kind of, or is there like a thousand years in there that we're comparing to, or what? So no, uh, no. Uh, because the earliest manuscripts that we could probably have in our possession are still uh, within the, the hundreds AD, okay. <clears throat> right? Um, but the Dead Sea Scrolls were written or copied in the first century, right? So, okay. and if, if I'm telling a lie here, some, someone please correct me, because now, now I'm off the cuff. Uh, based so who first put them together? Who made the, the first Bible? <clears throat> right. Yeah. Okay. Fair. Fair question. So it 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 wasn't until wait a minute. I'm gonna get you the right year because it's not in my head here, but I have it written down. Just a minute. 
Okay, let's talk about this. this I'll wrap up with this because I know we're running out of time. Sometimes you'll hear us talk about the word canon, C-A-N-O-N. We're not talking about a copier, and we're not talking about a weapon of war. Uh, two other uses of the word canon. So the, the, the Bible is the canonized version of scriptures. So as a reminder, there are other letters, there are other books, there are other spiritual documents that were written by people of faith during the same time that are not in our Bible. Some of those we call the Apocrypha, and other Christian traditions include some of them. Catholicism, for example, honors uh, some of the Apocryphal books. Some of our Protestant brothers and sisters also honor some of these books. <clears throat> Are they equally inspired? The answer that's come down through the ages is they've not been accepted at the same level, right? Which is not to say they're wrong, they just have not been ensconced in the tradition or the formal canon of this, right? So remember though, and we've talked about this before, Martin Luther hated the book of James, thought it shouldn't be in the Bible at all. And so, you know, you can make a case <laughs> on your own, you know, wishes, but what we have is a collection of books that over time have been found to be the most worthy, the most important uh, in this. And that, there have been church councils and all this uh, that, that and, and by the way, the same thing happened within Judaism to canonize the Jewish scriptures. Um, and, and this happened with the rabbis, and uh, th that's a separate history, right? But when you get to uh, what is the Christian Bible, uh, oh, Jewish Christianity um, persisted until around the 5th century, uh, and uh, there was maybe a different set of books there uh, as well. We talked about the Apocrypha being part of that as well. Uh, so another important word for you to know if you are taking a test in a Bible history class uh, is the Septuagint or the LXX, uh, which was what the early church had of the Old Testament, right? And it was, it was uh, basically a Greek version of the Hebrew Scriptures, right? Uh, and that was how they learned this. Uh, then we have the, all of these, th these things added. One of the first people to make up a canon of the New Testament was someone who turned out to be a heretic. <laughs> and his name was Marcion. We've talked about him before in the Marcion heresy. Uh, I won't go into in all that, but he was the first one to propose a uniquely Christian canon of, of this set of writings. And he wasn't wrong about that. He added in uh, he added in a, something that was found out to be heretical later on, right? So then well, this goes on through time. What was added that was found to be heretical? Uh, this was the what, Pelagian um Heresy. Um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I can't remember the exact nature of it. I, I, I've talked about this before, and I'm sorry, it, it's it's not on the tip of my head. Okay. Um, all right. So somewhere around the early third century, this is starting to form, and then gets formalized. You know, b beyond that. Uh, the Protestant Reformation further solidified this. Uh, there were various church councils that happened over time. Um, and then uh, Luther got involved at one point, wanted to move some stuff around uh, with this. Uh, and then in 1546, there was something called the Council of Trent uh, that approved the, the Bible as it currently exists in a Catholic version uh, of that. And then there are other things that have happened, uh, other councils. Uh, there's a council in Florence, council in Carthage, council in Rome. Uh, and uh, some of the books Luther had not wanted in there got put back in. Uh, and then all of this sort of cascades so that um, over, time, over time, by the around the Protestant Reformation, we end up in that same time period 
with the Bible sort of as, as, as we know it. Um, you know, that's, that's a long time ago to us, right? But think about the amount of time it took <laughs> from the first century to get there. And um, I, I want to close by this comment. Um, we, and there's so much more we can say about this. In this conversation with David Gushy this week, uh, he was talking about the historic ethic of, you know, the, the history of Christian ethics and how that informs us. And I was, I told y'all a story a few weeks ago about meeting this guy who was part of this sect, Christian sect, that he described as pre-Constantinian Christianity. They were wanting to roll back the clock to before Constantine corrupted Christianity as a state religion and just pick up there. Well, as David reminded me in this conversation, there's a big problem with that because the world didn't stand still during that time. <laughs> we can't act like nothing happened from Constantine to today, right? We can't ignore that there also has been understanding and developments uh, and teachings that inform us in our biblical scholarship. And we're always learning, always growing in that. Yes, Constantine corrupted Christianity, uh, but Christianity also survived, right? And so we, we can't ignore the history. We've got to learn from it, the good and the bad, as we continue to be shaped by the Bible, which describes itself as the living word of God. Pat. I have one question and I'm going to short answer. Okay. <laughs> My granddaughter asked me the other day, how do you know the Bible is true? What do you say to that to a child that is asking question in that? How do I know? The question is, to, how do you tell a, answer a child's question who wants to know, how do you know the Bible is true? Um, I would give two answers, maybe three, brief. One, because it has stood the test of time mm -hmm. and still with us over many, many centuries, right? Uh, number two, because of my personal experience in finding it to be true. And number three, because I believe in faith, this, this is the way God is working in the world. Any other questions? Man, this has been a whirlwind. Yeah. I have just recently, within the last few weeks, discovered that Southern Baptist seminaries today no longer offer any courses in Christian ethics. Uh, in your, now, I realize that starting about 30, 35 years ago, I have been increasingly sort of the black sheep on the right. horizon of Southern Baptist life. And so, right. you know, that's what I've always been up until I joined this church. <laughs> and uh, so I, I really paid very little attention to what's been going on. How did this happen? Why, did the, why is this happening? Is we may have to. Yeah. I'm going to give you a very quick answer to this question. The question is, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary or all SBCs? All six of them, I was told. You're told don't have Christian ethics anymore? I right. find that hard to believe. Um, I'll look into it this week and find out. Okay. Uh, I, I will double check on that. There's certainly, with the powers that be in the SBC, there's not a lot of interest in ethical um, conversation, except around certain issues. Uh, so you may remember, uh, the SBC used to have a Christian Life Commission uh, that now is the SBC Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. So they've combined those two things together. And a lot of it's about abortion, a whole lot of it's about abortion, uh, and, and a particular view of religious freedom. Uh, that, by the way, if you read the Dallas Morning News, uh, my buddy Ryan Sanders has the cover piece on the opinion section of the Morning News today. That is an outstanding piece about how do we move forward in combating Christian nationalism and our understanding. It's very constructive, very, very constructive. I highly recommend it to you. We've got to say goodbye to our uh, online folks here. Thank you so much for joining us. Next week, uh, Book of Ruth, we'll pick up there. Uh, sorry, we didn't get to the whole survey of the Bible today in 35 minutes or so. Let's pray together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers and grant us your peace, grant us your grace. Calm our troubled hearts, we pray. Help us, Lord, to have strength for this day and this week and guide us in our path, we pray. 
through Jesus Christ. Amen. Pat, can you